the function in some sense of the metric, g mu nu, and its derivatives. And so on. Yeah. And on the right hand side, this is the energy momentum tensor. So these are the sources. So matter, yeah, stars, galaxies, or in the early universe, dust and radiation. Yeah, so what Einstein's equation is, it's a differential equation for the metric that tells you how the metric. Uh, how, how space time is uh, uh, re uh, reacts uh, to the sources, so to the distribution of matter and radiation in the universe. And this is, of course, complemented by an equation of motion for the for the content of the universe as it is uh, affected by the matter fields. Yeah, uh, sorry, by, by by gravity. Yeah. So obviously, if you have a have a test particle, it will follow some some kind of trajectory. So this is then given by the geodesic equation. Okay. So in order to understand gravitational waves, one typically typically looks at the at the weak field limit of uh, general relativity. Namely, we expand around flat space time. So we write a metric, uh, lowercase g mu nu, as uh, a flat metric. Eta mu nu plus a small perturbation that we call H mu nu. Yeah, so eta mu nu is your normal uh, um, Minkowski metric, one minus one minus one minus one and zeros everywhere else. Uh, as you prefer, you can put a plus or a minus in front of it. And the deviations from flat space time are supposedly small. Yeah, so H mu nu should be much less than one for each component. Okay. So this is what we call the weak field limit of uh, general relativity. Of course, this weak field limit contains much more than just gravitational waves, namely uh, any kind of gravitational system that we experience here on earth, for example, also as the solar system is a weak field system, yeah? Because gravity is only really strong when you get close to the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole, for example. Yeah? So this weak field limit describes more than just gravitational waves. In particular, uh, it's possible to, uh, yeah, to identify the, the gravitational field of a star, for example, in, in this form. Yeah? So the field of a star, for example, can be written as uh, the, a zero zero component of the metric of the perturbation of the metric, and phi is then what we usually uh, consider as the gravitational potential, yeah? which is given by the by the Poisson equation. So uh, Laplace of phi of x equal to four pi g times the density of X. Yeah, so all of Newton gravity is, a lot. most of Newton gravity is contained in general relativity inside of the weak field limit. Okay. And since this is a field theory, yeah, so the, you, you can think of the, of the metric as a, as a field that essentially not only fills space time, but really is space time. Uh, but, but again, it's a field theory. So it's always useful to compare our, our intuition with that of uh, electromagnetism. Yeah, so in particular, we can ask what, what do we know about sourcing electromagnetic waves? Yeah, because what you're also very familiar with, for example, if you have a, a charge at rest, of course, a charge at rest also has a field, uh, just like the, the sun at rest has a gravitational field, any electric charge at rest has a, has an, uh, uh, yeah, generates an electric field. Um, so, so it's useful to, to remember how we actually generate radiation. 
in electrodynamics. And here the crucial insight is that you need accelerated charges. Yeah. So a charge at rest uh, has a field, but it does not radiate away energy. Yeah, that would violate energy conservation. And also a moving charge, which is not accelerated, cannot radiate electromagnetic waves because if if the if the charge is moving at a constant velocity, you can always find a a, a frame, uh, an inertial frame where it is at rest, and then obviously there is no emission of a field. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so obviously we will have a similar situation for emission of gravitational waves. You can't just have a big mass that will emit a big gravitational field, but it doesn't mean that you will have a have electro uh, have gravitational wave emission. Yeah, instead you will need masses which are accelerated or moving very fast. And the other thing that's useful to remember, although it's not an exact analogy, is that in electromagnetism, uh, the, the leading uh, term for, for, the, for the far field of, uh, of a source is, dipo uh, is, is dipolar. Yeah? So the, the electromagnetic radiation is dipole radiation. Gravitational waves, it's a little bit different. Um, there you have a... A quadrupole. Uh, the leading order is a, is a quadrupole. Yeah, so it's a little bit different, but it's always good to remember this intuition. Okay, so uh, there's also gauge invariance. Again, a concept that's similar to to electromagnetism, and this means that we can choose a gauge for our perturbation. Yeah, so for our uh, capital a uh, small h mu nu. And for gravitational waves, there's one particular gauge that's rather useful. And this is the so-called transverse and traceless gauge. Yeah, and this means that, uh, so, so it's usually written H mu nu TT for transverse traceless. And we put all the perturbations in the spatial directions. So it's zero up here and then two Sij. Yeah. And the reason that this is a very useful choice for of a gauge is because in this gauge, the vacuum equations of motion, so the, the Einstein equations uh, linearized in, in terms of the small perturbation. And in the absence of a source, they become very simple. Namely, it's just the D'Alembert operator, H mu nu, TT equals zero. Again, this is something that looks very familiar. Namely, it's exactly the same form that you can also find for the uh, equation of motion for electromagnetic waves. And obviously, also, the solutions are quite similar, namely the solutions to these uh, uh, linearized equations of motion, maybe I, I keep it like this, are the so-called plane waves. So H mu mu of uh, T and X is given by some prefactor, yeah, polarization tensor times E to the I K sigma X sigma. Where this combination is equal to omega t minus x times k. Okay. And furthermore, in order to actually uh, solve the equations of motion, we have to impose that the wave vector k sigma, uh, so yeah, k sigma, k sigma um, is zero. So this should be a light like vector. And it should be purely transverse. So, for example, we can choose um, k sigma in the following form. So, we can consider a wave propagating in the z direction. And in that case, the, 
the wave is transverse, yeah, transverse traceless, uh, and, and, which means that the polarization tensor takes a specific form, C mu nu. Um, yeah, looks like this. So we have lots of zeros. And then C11. C12 minus C11 and C12. Yeah. So you can check this is uh, transverse, traceless. And of course, since this is a perturbation of the metric, it should be symmetric. And the two remaining three parameters are the two polarizations that there are for gravitational waves. So C11 is typically called H plus and C12 is called H cross, yeah? And the name uh, originates from the way they they act on a, on a distribution of, of test particles as the wave passes through. So this is, this is shown here in these pictures for the plus polarization. So imagine you have a, 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 a ring of individual test particles, dust, yeah, which is floating freely in space. And now a gravitational wave passes through. It goes, yeah, through the through the uh, whiteboard here, through the piece of paper. And what it does is that it uh, it squeezes the the dust particles first in 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 one direction. Yeah, so it looks like the, the vertical line of the plus, and then in the other direction. Yeah, so it has this kind of uh, squeezing and squeezing the other direction. Yeah, that's what, what that's the effect of a gravitational wave on on matter that it passes through. Okay, and the other polarization, the cross polarization, uh, I mean, kind of does the same, but but uh, but twisted by forty five degrees. Yeah, so so it squeezes like this and then like that. And this immediately also tells you how, how you can try and look for gravitational waves. Yeah, you, you hang a set of masses somewhere and you try to, to measure these very small perturbations that the wave produces in your arrangement of, of test bodies. Okay. So um, maybe, uh, yeah, I should ask, are there, are there any, any questions? Uh, also, if you want very basic ones, yeah, if, if you have questions about the notation, for example, just let me know. I will wait for a minute. Yeah, sorry. So here, plus and cross, uh, you mean uh, the direction of um, polarization. So you mean when, uh, when uh, in initial direction, for example, it is in vertical direction. So when we do some the chain direction so it has become horizontal direction right and also uh, when we apply c12 for the initial direction we can change the direction of gravitational wave is it right um i mean it's it's it always of course depends on on how you choose your your frame of reference yeah so so indeed if you if you if you change coordinates by 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 forty five degrees, then then I think you you interchange the polarizations. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's I, it's just I, just a linear combination. Is mm -hmm. that was that a reasonable answer to your question? Yeah, I I I got it now. So it depends on the coordinate we choose. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, so can you explain again why you choose the TT gauge and also uh, why do we know that the K should be like like the K, K sigma should be like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, very good question. Thank you. So uh, the TT gauge is uh, really the choice is just because it makes the equations of motion look very simple. Yeah, you get this form in general. I mean, in general, what we do, let me go back. So we have uh, this uh, equation here, yeah, which is rather complicated. So we insert our expansion for the metric and we keep only the, the leading order terms, but you still get like six or eight terms. Yeah? And if you, if you choose a transverse traceless gauge, 
you find a particularly simple equation. In particular, uh, we also know the solution already. And, you know, why, why should you solve something more complicated? Uh, if, anyways, the, the solution is equivalent, right? Because it's, uh, it's a gauge, gauge invariant theory. So, uh, okay. if, if I understand correctly, like uh, you, you have a metric of a space time and you perturbate it uh, with the X mu nu, but you can choose like a frame to perturbate at the, just the I and J uh, in the space, not the time component. So, you will get a simple solution, uh, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I could, of course, tell you that we only ever look at one specific kind of perturbation. And then you would worry that maybe this is not the most generic gravitational wave uh, we find, yeah? However, due to gauge invariance, it's, it's a much stronger statement. Namely, we can show that it's enough to solve the, the system or, or to look at the system in this particular gauge and, and, and that this gives us all the gravitational waves that can be. So, what, what I mean here by, by, uh, by gauge transformation, of course, since this is, is the metric, uh, this is simply the fact that, that physics is invariant under changes of coordinate systems, right? Mm. Uh, so, so I can, uh, I can choose a, a, a coordinate system, which makes the, the gravitational waves look particularly simple. Okay. <coughs> okay. okay. And, about and, and then maybe, maybe the second, uh, question. Uh, I think this is uh, relatively straightforward. So, so here, this is our ansatz for the solution, right? Mm -hmm. So, when you plug this in here, in the equation of motion, here you have the the uh, d'Alembert operator. So, these are derivatives with respect to uh, x sigma here. Oops. Yeah. So, if you plug in the solution, uh, or, or if you plug in our ansatz here. Yeah, what you get is uh, is uh, k sigma squared. Yeah, so so this gives you k sigma, k sigma times uh, c mu nu e to the i k. Okay, let's give it a different name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you plug this in, you get this as a prefactor. <coughs> so this is only a solution to the equations of motion if this prefactor vanishes. Yeah, and that's how we find this condition. Okay, okay thank you. Again, thank it's uh, the same in the case of electromagnetism. Okay. So maybe I should uh, continue a little bit. So of course, once, uh, yeah, we have now shown that there are wave-like solutions to Einstein's theory of gravity. Now the question is, what kind of systems actually produce uh, gravitational waves? So now, again, we have to look at Einstein's equation. Again, we want to linearize it. And we find for the, for the uh, perturbations, so for the gravitational waves, we find an, an equation of the following form, HTT mu nu is minus uh, 16 pi g. And then of course you take the transverse and traceless part of the energy momentum tensor. So you project out uh, only a part of the, of the total matter, which actually contributes as a source term for gravitational waves. There's a little subtlety here that this is now the trace reversed perturbation, but uh, I don't want to go into, into so much detail. Uh, you can you can find this of course in most textbooks. Yeah, for example, in in the book by Carroll, it's a it's a somewhat compact uh, discussion. Okay, so when you look at this more carefully again, you see that this is again the um, this is now an in, an inhomogeneous wave equation with a source term, and the way that you solve such an equation is using uh, the method of Green's functions. Yeah, So you use the Green's function for the D'Alembert operator, which again is something that is also already appears in electromagnetism. Yeah, so solutions using Green's function. Yeah. 
Yeah, and if you, if you remember the Green's function is defined like this. So G of X minus Y is equal to Delta of four. Yeah, so the, the D'Alembert acting on the Green's function is equal to the Delta function. And if you have this Green's function, then you can write the solution in terms of the source. Oops. I think I stopped screen sharing apparently. Yeah, we cannot see whatever you wrote after you wrote solution using Green's function. So let me, uh, maybe I briefly disconnected. Let me. So I feel like I should be back now, but I'm not. This is a little bit annoying. Okay, give me a second, I'm trying to reconnect. Okay, this doesn't seem to be working. So we have to do a little less elegant uh, solution here where I will just share the notes that I have already written. Okay, now I can't see what you see. Well, so, uh, so do you see yeah. my notes again? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry, this is less optimal, but okay, let's just go with it. Okay, so um, exactly. So if you have the Green's function, you can find the, you can write the solution for the, for the, for, of, the of the wave equation in terms of, uh, of the source, yeah, using this Green's function. Uh, so this is the most general case. Of course, uh, we're not interested in the most general case. We are interested in, uh, in in the limit where we are far away from the source. Yeah. And in that case, you can show that that you can uh, simplify this expression. Yeah, you, you expand and so on. And then you, you find that the, that the field very far away from the source is essentially falls off like one over the distance from the source times the, the second time derivative of the so-called quadrupole tensor of the source, yeah, where this IIJ is the quadrupole tensor. So it's uh, given by this integral down here of the effectively of the zero, zero component of the metric, yeah. This is in the non-relativistic limit. So when your source is not relativistic, uh, as for example, if you look at a system of two black holes orbiting each other sometime before they merge, yeah, so before they speed up close to the speed of light. And that also explains why the, 
the zero zero component uh, enters here is because uh, as long as they are sufficiently slow, the, the masses are much larger than the kinetic energies. Again, this is a derivation that takes a few pages and you can find, for example, in Carroll. Okay, so, so now we kind of have established that there are gravitational waves and that there are sources for gravitational waves. And uh, I list a few here for you. So astrophysical sources are, as you probably know already, binary systems. So pairs of black holes that orbit each other and any kind of combinations of black holes and neutron stars, neutron stars, uh, pairs of neutron stars, white dwarfs, uh, and yeah, as, as you go to light, lighter masses, but also on the very heavy end, there are these supermassive black holes which sit at centers of galaxies. So often, uh, these are also binary systems, for example, from, from galaxy collisions. And these are all systems that we either have detected already, so in particular the case of uh, binaries, black hole binaries and combinations of black holes and neutron stars, or systems that we want to detect in the future. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, if you think about it, the, the lighter the system gets, uh, the, the higher the, the, the frequency, but then also if you go away from from the time where they actually merge to earlier times. Yeah, if you think about it, you have a lot of binaries, but only a few of them are very close to, to being, uh, to merging at this time. And as you go further away from the time of the merger, again, the frequency uh, decreases, yeah, because just the, the orbits are longer. Yeah, and, and the frequency of the gravitational wave corresponds to the orbit. Yeah, so if we want to observe, for example, these white dwarf binaries, um, the ones which are not currently merging, you would have to go to lower frequencies. And also for the supermassive black holes, just because the systems are so big, you need to go to really low frequencies. And as I will tell you in a few minutes, or maybe in a, more than a few minutes, uh, fortunately, we have plans for detectors across many, many frequencies. So this is actually something we will be able to do in the coming 10, 20, 30 years. So that's why I, I find this a, a very exciting field right now. One system that uh, uh, maybe you should have heard about, or I, I should tell you about if you haven't heard about it yet, is the so-called Halsey-Taylor binary. So this is a, is a binary system where one of the uh, stars in the binary is a pulsar which allows us to, to very uh, precisely observe the system and how it evolves in time. And what you see there is that this, uh, the orbital frequency of this pulsar decreases over time. Yeah? And now the question is, why does it decrease? In Newton gravity, this wouldn't happen. And the reason that the, the, this, this frequency uh, decreases, now actually, now the, the radius should decrease, the frequency should increase, um, is because the system loses energy due to gravitational wave radiation. Yeah? So this was established already in the 70s. And this was our first very clear evidence that gravitational waves do really exist, yeah? even though we haven't, at that time they were not detected yet. Yeah, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. So, so we could actually detect the energy loss of a system due to gravitational radiation much before we detected the radiation itself. Now what I uh, will focus on now are uh, cosmological sources of gravitational waves. So not gravitational waves that are emitted by astrophysical systems now-ish, but instead gravitational waves which were emitted in the very early universe very shortly after the Big Bang. Uh, for example, by uh, the, the dynamics of inflation, by cosmic strings, by phase transitions, or by the dynamics of scalar fields and axioms. Yeah. The reason, again, that this is that it's very interesting to search for such uh, gravitational waves is that gravitational waves can propagate uh, through the early universe for a, uh, without being disturbed. Yeah, so if you think about it, what we what we know so far about the early universe, we know it from observing very old stars 
And then if we go further back in time, we observe the CMB, but we know nothing about the time before the CMB uh, because all we see is electromagnetic radiation and, uh, and electromagnetic radiation um, before recombination was scattered by, by, the, uh, by, the, by the early universe plasma. Yeah? So there were free electrons and protons and photons just didn't uh, travel very far before being uh, scattered and, and change direction. Yeah, so if something is scattered very often, it loses all sorts of information. Yeah, so so we don't have any direct information about the very early universe before the emission of the CMB. Yeah, so the first three hundred thousand years are completely we are completely blind to them. And gravitational waves now could lift this blindness. Yeah, because Gravity decouples much earlier, very shortly after after uh, after the Big Bang, yeah, because the the gravitational coupling is so small compared to the electromagnetic coupling. Okay, so by observing gravitational or by searching for gravitational waves uh, from uh, very early times, we can potentially learn something about the early universe directly. Yeah, and in particular. What I will focus on is the physics of, of phase transitions. Okay. So maybe again, uh, I could take a question or two at this point, if there's something urgent. Okay, maybe not, then uh, I will continue. So I'm sorry that this is in, uh, yeah, I also, had shortened this a little bit. So now, now we have to scroll through it a little bit faster. Okay, so uh, all of you should be in some sense familiar with the concept of a phase transition, yeah, because this is, for example, what happens when um, a substance as, such as water goes from being liquid to being a gas, yeah, or melting of ice and so on. Um, or in general, when things go from an ordered state to a disordered state, such as when you have a crystal and it melts. Okay. And uh, another kind of phase transition, which is also uh, connected to this uh, phenomenon of, of changing order is, is when you have symmetry breaking. Yeah? So when, so, so we know that the electroweak symmetry if the standard model, and I think you had lectures on the standard model uh, earlier this week. So the symmet electroweak symmetry is broken by the by the Higgs mechanism because the, the Higgs potential has this form uh, where it has minima away from the origin. Yeah, so when the when the, the, the Higgs field is in this ground state, it means that there is a non-zero vacuum expectation value and that gives uh, masses to the gauge bosons and so on. Okay. So you can ignore most of, of the, the formulas here. And uh, well, okay. Now, what happens in the early universe is that the Higgs is uh, not by itself, yeah? But instead, if you, if you imagine like having, having a Higgs particle traveling through the early universe, it will bump into top quarks and it will bump into W and Z bosons. And those will generate an effective mass for the Higgs boson, yeah, which will counteract my uh, This uh, minus mu squared term that that creates these uh, minima away from the origin. Sorry, I hear some noise. Is there a question? No. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling a little bit now. Uh, because I wanted to skip these details. So what happens at at early temp uh, at, at high temperatures in the early universe is that instead of having a minimum away from the origin, at some uh, critical temperature, the symmetry will be restored. So the origin of the potential, with which uh, sorry the 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 minimum of the minimum of the potential, will move back to the origin. And the symmetry is unbroken. Yeah, that's why I say there is a phase transition. Yeah, so we go from 
from a phase of, uh, in the early universe, unbroken symmetry, so high symmetry, to a phase of, of uh, low sim broken symmetry at low temperatures. Now, if we do this exercise properly for the standard model, so if you follow some of the references I gave above, which I guess I will share the notes later. Um, I mean, what, what you want to do is you want to check what happens here as you cross from broken to unbroken symmetry. And in the standard model, this is a very smooth transition. Yeah, so the field will, as the temperature drops, adiabatically go move away from the origin, yeah, but not create many disturbances. So this is what we call a crossover. And that's, uh, in some sense, uh, at least from the point of view of gravitational waves, is a somewhat boring phase transition, yeah, because not much happens. However, it's very easy to modify the standard model or to look at theories uh, where the situation is different and where the following happens. So we kind of have the same initial state at high temperatures, the symmetry is restored, unbroken. The minimum of the potential is at the origin. And also at very low temperatures, we assume that we have broken symmetry. No. But now in between something different could happen, namely at some point, at some temperature, which I call T1 here, a second minimum starts to appear over here. At this point, this minimum is still not very interesting yeah, because the, the ground state of the system is still at the origin. So the symmetry is still unbroken. But as the temperature drops further, the second minimum um, at some point will be degenerate or can be degenerate with the first minimum at the origin. And this is what we usually call the critical temperature. Yeah, because at that point in time, in principle, it would be favorable for the universe to switch to this phase where symmetry is broken yeah, because the energy starts to be lower. However, if you look carefully now, the way that I drew this potential is that there is some, some barrier here. Yeah? So the field cannot just go from here to here. You need some amount of, of energy to go there. So this will just not happen. This is a you know a quantum mechanical problem if you want. Yeah, you, uh, a tunneling problem. You want to go here, but you cannot because there is a barrier in between and the tunneling probability uh, might be somewhat small. Okay, so 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 the the universe stays in this uh, unbroken phase, even though a more favorable phase would be accessible to it because uh, the the tunneling rate is too small. Until eventually, as you keep evolving, the barrier might shrink a little bit, and this minimum might get deeper and deeper. Eventually, the system will tunnel to the true ground state. Again, this is something you can compute. Uh, you can compute the probability to form uh, for, for the system to transition from the from the false to the true vacuum um, yeah, using this uh, formalism. I didn't want to go into much detail on this. And yeah, now, now the point is that that such a transition now is more similar to uh, the boiling of water, yeah? So you heat the system, but it doesn't transition from liquid to gas everywhere. Instead, you start to form bubbles of the of the true ground state. Yeah, for example, for boiling water, it, it's gas, and then these bubbles, if you provide enough energy, they will expand and eventually fill the whole space. So this is really one way of thinking about such a, a, what we call first order phase transition. Yeah, the universe will not jump to the correct vacuum everywhere. But you know, depending on small fluctuations, some region might randomly tunnel to the true ground state. And when it does it, it gains this energy difference. Yeah, So it's energetically favorable to be in this ground state and then these bubbles will grow and they might grow very quickly. So you would have a lot of energy in these bubble walls. And eventually these bubble walls will start to collide and that will create a, a large anisotropic stress. So something that can source gravitational waves in the early universe. 
Okay. This, of course, I could spend several lectures on. So I will just give you the the very basic uh, uh, summary of uh, of what we know about such phase transitions. Yeah, the nice thing is that there is a certain amount of universality. Yeah, it's usually even if you have a very complex uh, model, it's one one effective field direction that undergoes the phase uh, that 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 yeah that you can use to model this uh, this transition. And then the the intensity and and the features of the gravitational waves that are produced in this phase transition uh, are given in terms of a small number of parameters, namely essentially the amount of energy that is freed up. Yeah, so the potential difference, and then so this is usually a parameter called alpha here. So it's the potential difference divided by the total energy density. The second parameter is usually called beta, or more more precisely, it's uh, it's this uh, beta divided by the Hubble rate. This tells you how fast the transition happens. Yeah. So is will there be one bubble that grows and fills almost the whole Hubble, uh, the whole uh, yeah the the whole Hubble patch, or does the transition happen very fast? Will you will there will there be many small bubbles popping up and then uh, merging? And, fill, and filling the whole universe. So it turns out that one bubble that grows very big and then collides is a much better source of gravitational waves, yeah, because you put more energy in in the in the bubble wall, or, and and you you disturb the plasma more. Okay, so these are two of the parameters that uh, that tell you about the, the the gravitational wave signal, and then the third one is the temperature at which this happens which is typically related to the to the scale of the problem yeah so for example the electroweak scale in the case of the higgs uh, yeah of the standard model okay so this is what we call the the critical or the more precisely the nucleation temperature okay now so so this then somehow Gives us an intuition of what what kind of gravitational waves are uh, uh, produced, and I, I just want to give you a brief uh, intuition of what what we could observe today. Yeah, in particular in terms of the frequency of gravitational waves. So the frequency is uh, yeah, the frequency is the inverse of a wavelength. Yeah, and the wavelength is given by the size of one of these bubbles. Yeah. So of course you know you have to average things and so on, but 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 there's there's a specific uh, size for for one of these bubbles, an average size, and of course it can't be larger than the the size of the of of the causally connected universe. So it's it's kind of given by 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 the Hubble rate at the time of. Uh, of the phase transition, so this is what we call h star. Yeah, so one over h star is is the radius of the observable universe at that time. Then we have the the velocity or the, uh, the, the this uh, yeah this uh, parameter that tells you how fast the transition happens, because as I said before, if you nucleate more small bubbles, this will suppress the signal. So it's uh, yeah it's one over beta, so small beta is better. And then, of course, the size of the bubble depends also on the bubble wall velocity. So if it uh, expands slowly, the, the wavelength will be smaller. OK, so this we can use to, to obtain the wavelengths of the gravitational wave at the time of emission. And then, as I said before, gravitational waves, waves simply propagate. So nothing else happens to them. So all that happens to any kind of radiation in the early universe is that it's redshifted. Yeah? As the universe expands, it will also stretch the wavelengths of these gravitational waves. And we can obtain uh, this redshift factor by multiplying the frequency at the time of emission with the ratio of scale factors at the time of emission to the scale factor today. And this is more or less related to the ratio of temperatures. Okay. So it's relatively easy. Yeah, so this is why 
why the the frequency of a gravitational wave for example from a phase transition in the early universe only essentially only depends on the the temperature of the universe at the time of the transition so at t of a t star and when you plug in the numbers you find that for a phase transition at the weak scale so or the 100 gev the characteristic frequency is in the millihertz regime, yeah, 10 to the minus 5 hertz, and then you have this uh, factor beta. Okay, so the signal is typically uh, peaked. So the peak is given by, by this, uh, the peak frequency is given by, by this uh, characteristic frequency, and then there is a, a tail on both sides. Yeah, so by, by changing the, 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 uh, temperature of the phase transition, for example, by going away from the standard model, looking at phase transitions at higher scales or at lower scales, you can move around the peak, the peak frequency, and then changing alpha will increase or decrease the amplitude. Yeah, so you can imagine if you have if you gain more energy from the phase transition, you will have a bigger signal. If you gain less energy, you have a smaller signal, and then uh, yeah, then it has some non-trivial scaling with with uh, this uh, velocity, yeah, uh, with with this uh, time scale of the phase transition beta, which moves the signal in in kind of a diagonal direction. Okay. And again, for a specific uh, beyond the standard model scenario, you can compute the effective potential, and then determine. Uh, look, find, look, look for this uh, bounce solution that gives you the tunneling action that tells you when the transition happens. And then you can compute these parameters and predict the gravitational wave signal using some extra uh, input from the literature. Okay. Now you can ask what kind of detector you need in order to detect, for example, gravitational waves of order 10 to the minus three Hertz. So gravitational waves that could come, for example, from electroweak symmetry breaking in an extension of the standard model. So of course you can easily convert a frequency into, well, from the frequency you can get the wavelengths. So for, for millihertz, it corresponds to 10 million kilometers roughly, which immediately tells you that an optimal detector will not be on earth, yeah? because earth is not so big, but instead, you can try to build your gravitational wave interferometer in space. And this is what the LISA mission aims to do. Now, this will be a satellite experiment with an arm length, I think of four or 5 million kilometers. You know, three satellites that will form a uh, michelson molly interferometer. Well, actually it will be a triangular setup. So you have multiple baselines that you can interfere. And this is set to launch sometime in, in a bit more than 10 years. Yeah, so it's a, it's a mission that was approved by, by the European Space Agency, supported by NASA and several other countries. And one of the things that this uh, LISA gravitational wave detector will be able to do is to probe gravitational waves from early universe phase transitions. A uh, few more details about, you know, this overall prospects of testing gravitational waves. So typically what you have we have this kind of signal again, the, the blue line, a peak signal with a characteristic frequency. And then the experiments also have some kind of sensitivity range. Yeah, So there's a frequency where the experiment is most sensitive corresponding to the arm length, and then um, it weakens to both sides. So whether or not a signal is detectable, in particular such a, a stochastic signal as you get from primordial sources, depends on whether you have sufficient overlap of the, the predicted signal with the sensitivity of the experiment. And this is what is called the signal to noise ratio. And it's now essentially really computed like this. Yeah, you, you do this integral. If you have a model, you, you predict your, your amplitude of the gravitational wave signal, and then you check what is the sensitivity curve for a given gravitational wave experiment and you can compute the signal to noise ratio. And uh, uh, yeah, just to give you an idea what's on the market. So what we just discussed here is this uh, LISA experiment, which will be most sensitive to gravitational waves 
of order millihertz. And then if you convert this to temperature scales for phase transitions, this really puts you in the electroweak scale to TeV range. You probably all know very well that there's the LIGO experiment, and by now there's also Virgo and Kagra, which are online and contributing to uh, detecting gravitational waves on Earth. So the characteristic frequency there is of order 100 hertz, yeah, plus minus order of magnitude. So um, higher frequencies um, corresponds to gravitational uh, to phase transitions at earlier temperatures. Yeah. So if future generations of ground-based gravitational wave detectors will be able to probe phase transitions, for example, in the in the PEV range. Instead, if you go to the other end of the range, um, well, you see here's a gap. This is also interesting, maybe something to think about for people. Um, if you go to very low frequencies, yeah, you have to think about what this means. 10 to the minus nine Hertz or 10 to the minus eight Hertz is roughly an inverse year. Yeah, So you go up for half a year, you go down for half a year. And of course you have huge wavelengths. Yeah, so you no, know, almost the uh, well, size of the of the solar system, larger than the size of the solar system. So yeah, one way of building uh, or, or something that provides a detector for, for such low wavelength uh, long wavelengths are systems of pulsars. Yeah, because we can observe many pulsars in the sky. And these are very stable clocks. Yeah, so we can measure the time when the light arrives from a pulsar. Yeah, and you do this over many years, and you build a time series, and you do this for many pulsars. And any two pulsars together with us form an interferometer for gravitational waves. So if a gravitational wave passes through between us and these pulsars, it will distort these arrival times. Okay, and by looking at the at the at the network of of uh, pulsars and observing them regularly, uh, we can uh, we can search for gravitational waves with these very low frequencies. This is what is called a pulsar timing array, and several of these pulsar timing arrays are online. Yeah, these are essentially X-ray telescopes that uh, or in, in collaborations that um, that get part of the time of these uh, telescopes to observe these pulsars. Yeah? So one of these is uh, Nanograph, North American uh, something something observatory, nanohertz uh, gravitational wave observatory. There's also Parkes Pulsar Timing Array, which is uh, uh, more based in, in Asia and Australia and, and the EPTA, European Pulsar Timing Array, okay? Now again, you can convert this uh, this frequency into a new physics scale, and you see that this would now correspond to uh, to phase transitions happening in the MeV to GeV range. Okay. Now, um, yeah, I'm essentially out of time, uh, so I will not not cover scalar fields. But there's one thing in the in the scalar field slide that I want to show you. So let me switch slides for one second. So, okay. Now, the reason I, I spent so much time talking about uh, about this pulsar timing arrays is that there is now a signal. Yeah, so this is from this paper two thousand two two thousand nine. Uh, yeah, from from last year. Yeah, no, two years ago already. So uh, yeah, September two thousand uh, two thousand twenty by the Nanograph collaboration. Uh, it's not super uh, clear what this plot means, but uh, effectively, the fact that these uh, these gray blobs here are, are not uh, are not a straight line that hit the origin, but but are uh, somehow uh, uh, enhanced here means that there is some non-trivial um, noise yeah, above what what the instrumental noise should be. 
So, so, so nanograph has seen a first hint for, for what they call a common spectrum process in their data. And since then, uh, the other pulsar timing arrays have also started to look at their data more carefully and they are all agreeing that there is uh, some, some hint for something going on in the data. They have not yet claimed discovery of uh, gravitational waves because in order to claim that you want to show that, that the angular correlation also is consistent with gravitational waves. Uh, I can say more about this if you want later. Uh, I mean, if you have a question on it. In any case, we managed to convert this, uh, these blobs into something we were able to understand, namely gravitational wave amplitudes. So this is uh, as a function of the frequency, this is what you, what you see over here. And uh, yeah, in this paper, we showed that indeed, a phase transition at a very low temperature of order 10 MeV um, could explain the signal. Yeah. Doesn't, of course, mean that this is the only explanation. But essentially, if you go through this list that I showed before, cosmic strings can also do it. It's very difficult to do it with inflation. Uh, you can also do it with scalar field dynamics. Uh, this I didn't have time to go into, what, what we mean by audible axiom. Now, anyways, this is uh, somehow a very recent development now. And, and of course, uh, they, uh, they, these collaborations are now paying much more attention to their data. They already have, so, so I think this was from 12 years of data in the nanograph collaboration. So they now already have 15 years of data that they will analyze, will provide updates. So, so of course we can hope that within a few years, we will really establish the first observation of gravitational waves at very low frequencies. Uh, of course, uh, this is also where the backgrounds from, from supermassive black holes would be. So we will have to, to work quite a bit to convince ourselves to find out whether there is some new physics component there. Yeah, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting development and maybe a, this is a good point for me uh, to end this lecture and uh, uh, enter the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this great lecture. Uh, I, we are open for the questions. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself and you can directly ask your questions. Or you can type in the chat box. Yeah, I don't know right now if I can see the chat. Um, maybe I stopped my sharing and then uh, if I need to show something, I will start it again. If no one has maybe Pedro, could you say, say a little bit more about this nanograph observations and and what other what the other experiments are trying to do? Yeah, so I mean, essentially, yeah, you really you record the time yeah, for for these individual pulsars, and and then. Uh, you, you can essentially correlate pairs of pulsars and see if there is some, some non-trivial uh, uh, discrepancy there, yeah? A anything that, you, you know, if you have two clocks and you observe your clocks, usually, you know, every second the clock will tick. And if, let's say every minute, yeah, the, your, your clock ticks every minute. And then if you, if you, if you look a bit, uh, if you look at some point, you see that one of the clocks is delayed suddenly. Yeah, this, uh, this would be a hint that something changed the runtime, the arrival time of, of light from that, from that clock. Yeah? So that, that's kind of the basic principle. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that, that of course, in, instead of having a fixed triangle like, or, or a fixed uh, re rectangle, as in the case of, uh, of LIGO, uh, the pulsars are scattered all over space. Yeah? So you have many different angles and many different inclinations. So, uh, and then uh, if you remember the way a gravitational wave works, yeah, if you take a ring-shaped uh, distribution of masses, they, they, yeah, there's a certain correlation if the wave passes through, it will, yeah, so, so, yeah, so depending on the angle of the pulsar, it will see, and, and the orientation, it will see the gravitational wave or not. Yeah, so, so you can essentially um, plot this as a function of the angle and the gravitational wave because of uh, exactly these uh, 
uh, quadrupole nature because of this polarization will have a very specific angular distribution. This is called the Hellings and Downs curve. Instead, if you had something else that gives you this discrepancy, say for example, you had some funny wobbly motion in the in the orbit of the Earth, that would be a that would be a scalar disturbance. So it would not have this angular dependence. Yeah. So one of the things that these experiments will now try to do over time is to establish that indeed the signal has the right angular dependence to be consistent with a gravitational wave signal. And uh, I mean, what, what the different experiments are doing are essentially they are uh, observing different pulsars, some of them overlapping, yeah, and then uh, doing the same analysis. Of course, you, there's a lot of details that go in, yeah, lo looking for, for possible sources of noise, uh, things which are noise, uh, noise sources in individual pulsars and common noise sources, of course. And then uh something which is then called the uh, the international pulsar timing array is aims to to combine the data and they also had recently i think this week they had the first data release of course they use somewhat older data but they also are agreeing with uh with these findings so yeah i think in, in i mean what what we really the first thing that that we're really looking forward to is once the statistics is good enough that we should see this, this uh, angular correlation emerge that hopefully will be consistent with gravitational waves, that would be a clear hint that it is not some other source of noise. And then, you know, as you go further into the future, of course, you hope to identify individual contributions if this is really from astrophysical sources, yeah, for example, from supermassive black hole mergers, you would try to identify and subtract the sources. I think at the moment it's, for example, it's not clear if this signal is manifest and uh, at, the, at the size that, that it's being seen right now, uh, whether this could indeed be consistent with astrophysical sources or whether it's really already a hint for, for a new physics source from, from early universe uh, dynamics. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, do you think that uh, cosmic strings and uh, monopoles, uh, they have any significance uh, in uh, uh, nanograph? Uh, should we expect uh, some significant results regarding defects? Yeah, so in, in, in particular, yeah, cosmic strings is, is one of the probably one of the best models to, to explain this data. Because, so if, what I mean, what we did was uh, also partially because the cosmic strings were done by someone else, but uh, since I work on phase transition, I tried with phase transition. So if you have a phase transition at this very low scale, uh, a few MeV, it's very difficult to have this consistent with cosmology, yeah? Because phase transition means that, that something is going on, but, at the MEV scale, we already have indirect probes of the early universe from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So you have to engineer your model very, very carefully to get a strong enough phase transition without, uh, for example, uh, screwing up nucleosynthesis or, or, or adding too much dark radiation. And somehow cosmic strings can, can evade most of these problems. Yeah, so cosmic strings are not, not string theory strings, but these are really... Um, uh, yeah, defects that, that form in, in certain uh, uh, theories with broken symmetries. And uh, yeah, they, they, they can form in the early universe and then um, these, uh, these strings. So if you have them in, in the universe, they, they have certain dynamics. Yeah, so the, so the strings can somehow intersect. And in particular, what can happen is that, is that when, when they intersect, they can, can somehow uh, uh, cut off a loop, yeah. So a, a circular kind of string, and those strings can uh, essentially uh, evaporate through gravitational wave emission. And uh, and and the good thing is that that these uh, these cosmic strings enter some kind of uh, equilibrium balance between. Um, they are radiating away, but being also replenished because they redshift less than than uh, than radiation. 
yeah so somehow uh, these these are quite um, quite good at explaining the signal and due to this uh, scaling behavior that i just mentioned uh, they they also predict a gravitational wave signal across many frequencies yeah so if we see them in nanograph it's quite likely that we will also see them in lisa and maybe in the future in a follow up to ligo for example in einstein telescope or cosmic explorer so I think it's something uh, very interesting to watch out for. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting uh, field. Great, thanks. Uh, there is a question on chat. Yeah. Uh, so Monica, um, I, I can read it if you want. No, yeah, I, I'm reading it. So yeah, the question is whether there are websites or, or databases where where people can get uh, data to work on gravitational wave identification. Yes. So, for example, for for these pulsar timing arrays, at least I know it for for nanograph and for the Parkes pulsar timing array. You can go to their website. You can uh, download the data. So it's really yeah strings of timing data, and they also provide some of the basic tools to to analyze this data. Yeah. So you can you can go to these collaborations, and and of course you know the. The public data is uh, is one cycle behind usually, but 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 you can go there. So yeah, it's uh, yeah nanograph and and Parkes pulsar timing array, and I think also LIGO has a very good open data policy. So I think people have already uh, written codes and reanalyzed the data and found found additional merger candidates in in the old LIGO data. So indeed, there's a there's a yeah there's there's a lot going on. I mean, you can message me if, if you need uh, if you need links. Um, thanks. So uh, I have a question that uh, beside like axion and axion like particle, can we use uh, gravitational way to probe any other particle like any type of dark matter? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a it's a very rich question. So of course the yeah, in some sense you can probe any kind of new physics that has a has a has a phase transition, for example. Of course, then what's actually accessible is a small fraction of model parameter space where, space where the signal is strong enough and and falls in the right frequency range. And of course, the same is true for for axions, although I didn't go in in much detail. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. For in the case of axions, you need a very large decay constant in order to be able to probe the model. Um, what's what's also very interesting, where I didn't, uh, uh, which, which I didn't mention at all here, is this uh, physics of super radiance. Yeah, so if you have a if you have a black hole, and if there is a very light particle in the theory, yeah, something like uh, ten to the minus uh, ten electron volt. Then these very light particles can form bound states together with a black hole, and these are uh, uh, somehow unstable, so they will uh, start accreting around the black hole. And this has the effect that it can spin down a black hole. Yeah. So if so, black holes are characterized by very few uh, quantum numbers. In particular, I mean they have a mass. They can have a charge, but the charge is usually very small. But they can have a large spin. And and if you have these very light particles in the theory, they don't even have to couple to anything. Yeah, they just have to be there. And then since they interact gravitationally, they they will start to 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 form these these gravitational bound states with the black hole, and they will spin down all of the black holes. So simply by observing a number of black holes with finite in in a certain mass range with a, with non non zero spin uh, we can exclude uh, certain mass ranges for these uh, uh, very light particles it doesn't matter whether it's an axion or, a, or it can also be vector bosons very light bosons yeah so indeed uh, since uh, so indeed the ligo data and now in particular since we are accumulating large statistics of binary black hole mergers from the waveform you can reconstruct the properties of the initial black holes 
and we have identified, or we have, uh, and, and this has shown that there are black holes which are larger with a large amount of spin. And this indeed now you can convert this into constraint on uh, very light particles in again in this mass range of 10 to the minus, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 10 electron volt. This of course is valid under the assumption that these particles have very few self interactions. Once these particles have self interactions, so then you know this disrupts these uh, this systems. So then it's more difficult to have a prediction. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's quite a few things. The one thing that's very difficult is to really make a concrete statement about about dark matter. Yeah, but dark matter itself doesn't affect. Uh, uh, doesn't produce gravitational waves in an observable amount. Of course, you can look at the, uh, at a variety of scenarios. For example, if you have a dark sector, it's quite likely that it will have some non-trivial dynamics, could have a phase transition, and then you have an observable signal. Yeah, that kind of arg argument you can make. But for example, you can easily uh, yeah, but but it's it's more indirect. I think yeah? it's a, it's a way of probing. New physics, which is very difficult, which might be very difficult to access otherwise. For example, if you have a dark sector, yeah, which is very weakly coupled, you cannot uh, access it in the laboratory. But of course, gravitational waves don't care because everything has to couple to gravity. Yeah, so 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 in that sense, it's a very interesting probe of new physics, very generically. But but it's more difficult to say let's let's probe a concrete model. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Schwager, uh, for giving this wonderful lecture. I think a little bit over time, let's move on to the next lecture uh, by Dr. Kevin and Paolo. Yes, yes. Sir. Mir. Can okay, you thank it? you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes, can I? So I, I will share my iPad. So maybe you can, let's see if I can. I can do it, uh, share. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Very good. Very good, so can I start? Yes, yes, please, please go ahead. So thanks, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so before getting to the um, to the subject, uh, let me uh, since I work at ICTP, uh, let me explain what uh, ICTP is for uh, uh, for the people in uh, online uh, because it may be of interest uh, uh, to some uh, some of you. So ICTP means uh, uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics. It's uh, an institution in Trieste uh, in. Uh, um, in Italy, we are very close to the border with uh, uh, with the Slovenia. We are here, and um, we are very close to the sea. So ICTP is uh, here. Actually, I am here exactly, and uh, we are very close to a castle, the Miramare Castle. So it's a it's a beautiful place. Um, so why um, so why you should care about ICTP? Well, uh, uh, ICTP is uh, uh, a center um, which is run by three institutions, uh, that is to say UNESCO, uh, the International Atomic Agency for uh, uh, International At uh, Atomic Energy Agency, and uh, the Italian government. And it was funded by uh, Abdul Salam in uh, 1964. And this, of course, creates a connection with uh, the, these uh, series of, uh, uh, of conferences uh, since uh, Salam uh, was one of the founders, as far as I understand, of this uh, series of, uh, of conferences. Let me, let me say also that uh, uh, money mostly come from, money for ICTP mostly come from the Italian government. And uh, so what is the, the, the purpose of ICTP? Well, the, 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 our motto, if you want, uh, is uh, this sentence is to foster the growth of advanced studies uh, and research in physical and mathematical sciences uh, especially in support of excellence in developing countries. Okay. And uh, um, so in, uh, in, uh, I will explain a bit what we do. Uh, let me also say that the director uh, nowadays is Atish Tabolkar, 
uh, a string theorist from uh, from India originally, and he has been the director of ICTP since uh, uh, 2018. So what the, what do we, what do we do, and why this should be of interest? Well, first of all, we have five different uh, um, research section. One is the the high energy one, uh, more properly is high energy cosmology and astroparticle physics. There is a condensed matter section. There is a mathematics section. There is a section which works on seismology and uh, weather. Um, and then there is a, a, a new one, a recent one, which is uh, basically um, working on quantitative biology. It's called quantitative life sciences. So these are five directions in which uh, we, we work, plus some additional uh, a small uh, activity. Um, so what happens at ICTP? Well, in, in uh, okay, of course, now we have COVID, but uh, in, a, in a normal year, we would have uh, many activities on campus, uh, about 50 activities. These activities can be schools, can be conferences, can be workshops. And the difference uh, compared to in, uh, in other places is that uh, we have a substantial amount of money to bring people from all over the world. So basically, it means that these uh, uh, activities, uh, they usually have uh, more uh, participations from uh, countries uh, which are uh, less rich um, because uh, uh, one can apply for funding to travel and to spend time here at STP. Uh, we also have activities uh, in developing countries, uh, about 15 each year. Uh, we have uh, a, what is called a diploma program that is to say, it's a, it's a pre-PhD pre program, uh, which basically um, aims to bring uh, students from developing countries to the level of applying for a PhD, uh, um, whatever, in the States, in Europe, uh, or wherever in the world. We have about uh, 50 students per year in all the different uh, sectors. And, and of course, all these students, they have a grant. So they, they come and they travel and uh, the stay in Trieste is fully covered. Then we have many visitors. In a normal year, we would have about 6,000 visitors per year. There are various ways to, um, to be associated with ICTP. Um, one can be an associate, which means uh, somebody that visits uh, regularly uh, ICTP. Uh, one can be a step student, which means a, student, a PhD student that spend uh, a fraction of the PhD here at STP and, and, and so on and so forth. One can ask for, for, for long visits, uh, sabbaticals, and so on and so forth. On top of that, of course, uh, we have uh, research in the sense that uh, we are a center in which uh, we have a faculty, we have postdocs. Of course, uh, we try to maximize the diversity of uh, uh, nationalities. Uh, we have PhD students uh, in collaboration uh, with the nearby institution, which is CISA. And uh, finally, we have uh, um, partner institutes uh, so if you want uh, small ICTPs or uh, that, uh, that um, one is in Sao Paulo in Brazil, one is in Rwanda uh, in, uh, in Kigali in the capital, uh, and uh, one is uh, in Mexico. Um, then we're thinking about a new one in China and uh, maybe other ones. So this is just an introduction to ICTP. And uh, so I suggest you to visit our uh, website and to look for possibilities if you're interested in uh, applying to one of these activities and to come and visit us. Okay, so this is a, was an introduction since, uh, um, since uh, um, I think it's important to let uh, people know about ICTP. Uh, please, if you have questions about this, you can send me an email uh, um, and, uh, um, and I will try to, uh, to, to answer and tell you um, what are the possibilities. So let's uh, now go back to uh, the, uh, the lecture. So uh, I decided to, um, to focus on a particular aspect of dark energy. Of course, uh, you know, um, one hour is not enough to cover many subjects. And I decided to focus uh, on a particular aspect, which is uh, um, interesting and uh, kind of new in this uh, uh, area. And also the reason why I decided uh, well, there are two reasons why I decided to focus on this particular subject. One is the fact that you just have uh, you just had a lecture about gravitational wave, and also you had an introduction to dark energy by Josh Freeman. So I thought that it was nice to put these two together. Um, of course, uh, 
I, I also decided the, this topic because I worked on this. So I say this just to say that uh, I'm not saying that this is the only important subject in dark energy these days, but it's something that uh, I uh, I worked on and uh, I think it's uh, it's interesting. But uh, of course, it's uh, it's just uh, one corner of uh, uh, what's going on in uh, in dark energy in, uh, in these days. Please interrupt me if you have questions. So I think it's uh, it's okay. Um, so you just heard about gravitational waves, so I don't want to spend too much time. Um, so uh, one reason to show this this picture is that is because uh, um, I want to uh, advertise that uh, we uh, so we have the two LIGO detectors in uh, in the United States, but also we have a, de a detector in in Italy. So since I'm in Italy, I I, I I want to stress this. And these three detectors are working now together and uh, they are giving uh, uh, all uh, the beautiful information about uh, uh, gravitational waves. So as, as, you, as you heard, this, uh, this story began uh, uh, almost uh, yes, six years ago um, with um, the first detection of um, uh, black hole mergers. And uh, uh, so since I'm a theorist, uh, let me also uh, stress uh, the uh, craziness uh, the, uh, of these uh, results from the experimental point of view. Uh, let me remind you, as you heard, that uh, the experimental accuracy to detect uh, gravitational waves uh, um, of, the, of the kind we detected uh, in the last few years uh, requires to, um, to, to monitor the, um, the distance in the two, arm, in the two arms uh, of uh, the inter in interferometer with a precision of, of order 10 to minus 21, because uh, you remember this is the typical size of a gravitational wave uh, when it is detected. And uh, uh, 10 to minus 21 means that uh, it would be the same as detecting and, as, and monitoring the distance from the earth to the sun with a precision of an atom. Okay. So this, uh, I think, uh, um, I just want to, 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 to say this, uh, just to, 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 to remark that uh, the, the, the experimental results are just uh, completely mind-blowing and uh, um, I cannot overemphasize this uh, more. Um, so this is the first event that uh, was detected uh, um, in 2015 um, with the two detectors in, uh, um, in LIGO because Virgo was not uh, working uh, back then. Um, a very clear uh, signal. And after that, we detected uh, many others. Um, let me um, focus in particular uh, on, on the fact that uh, um, after uh, Virgo turned on, with three detectors, it is possible to do a, uh, an efficient uh, triangulation so, and to know where the signal is coming from in the sky. And in particular, we were able, so they were able to detect uh, um, a particular event um, and uh, localize it in the sky. And in particular, they were able to follow it uh, with uh, um, uh, looking at the same event uh, in electromagnetic waves uh, in, in various frequency. And uh, it turns out that this event was a neutron star merger. And uh, of course, this opens uh, a a whole uh, uh, interesting subject of what we can learn from uh, uh, about astrophysics, uh, about uh, the physics of these, uh, um, of these interesting objects, besides uh, not only black holes, but also neutron stars, uh, test the general relativity and so on and so forth. Here, I want to focus on something different, uh, um, which, is, uh, uh, which has to do with uh, dark energy. Uh, before getting to dark energy, let me uh, mention uh, these, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you, you, you saw this, but uh, let me uh, remind you that uh, the observation of gravitational waves uh, together with uh, an electromagnetic counterpart was, uh, uh, gave uh, a very nice uh, measurement of the speed uh, of gravitational waves. So you see it uh, very nicely in this plot. So on, on the bottom, uh, there is the gravitational wave signal, which is this line over here. So this line, uh, is the usual uh, chirping because the two um, the two sources uh, the two uh, masses are orbiting each other and are progressively losing energy and therefore they are uh, going faster and faster. So the emission of gravitational waves uh, does not have uh, a constant frequency, but it has a frequency that uh, uh, grows in uh, in uh, uh, in.
in time until uh, at a certain point uh, you have the final uh, mer merger of the two um, masses. Now, this is what you see in gravitational waves, but uh, since we, you know, so since now we're talking about uh, neutron stars, so there is also emission of uh, electromagnetic radiations. And in particular, you can observe these uh, using uh, Fermi data, but uh, it was observed in many other uh, frequencies. But in particular, you see that there is a, a bump over here. So clearly these two events uh, are, are, are related. So there is an offset between uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, and uh, electromagnetic waves, which is of, uh, of order a couple of seconds. This is probably due to the fact that uh, it takes a bit of time for light to come out of uh, the neutron star merger. So I'm not an expert of this, but as far as I understand, this is uh, compatible with what is, it was expected. So basically, apart from this uh, slight difference in the, in the emission, because, uh, uh, because we're looking at different uh, kind of uh, waves, what you should learn from this uh, uh, graph is that uh, apart from this error, let's, say, let's, let's assume that this is some sort of uh, experimental error of order a couple of seconds, it takes uh, about the same time for gravitational waves and light uh, to propagate from the Newton star events uh, uh, to, uh, to the detectors. And this is a, is a remarkable uh, result because of course, uh, we're talking about a distance uh, from earth of about 40 megaparsec. And you're comparing these with uh, a couple of seconds, which is this uh, uh, error that we have because uh, the, the emission of the two sources is not, is, is not really at the same time, but this gives uh, very nice uh, bounds uh, on uh, the speed of gravitational waves. So you see it uh, from, uh, from here. Uh, we, the, the, basically, the, um, the speed of gravitational waves is the same as the speed of uh, uh, light up to corrections, which are about uh, 10 to minus 15, 10 to minus 16, which is basically the ratio between uh, one or two seconds compared to the time it takes uh, to light to go through 40 megaparsecs, which is the distance from this, uh, this event. So a single event is enough uh, to set uh, very nice bounds on a quantity that we didn't really uh, know. So uh, we didn't know much. Uh, I will come back to, to this uh, in, in a second, but we didn't know much about uh, the value of the speed of gravitational waves, uh, while after this event, we have uh, um, very nice uh, constraints. Okay, so, so this is just uh, to say that uh, we are learning a lot about um, um, about the fundamental physics uh, on top of uh, um, astrophysics, of course, and, and general relativity. Uh, but you can ask, okay, why this has to do with uh, dark energy? So you, 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 you heard this, uh, the talk by Josh Freeman about uh, um, dark energy, so I, uh, I'm not going to, to repeat much. Uh, in, pra in practice, uh, dark energy, it is something uh, which is uh, approximately homogeneous over space um, and cause the acceleration of the universe that we observe um, in, in, many, um, in many data. And I'm sure uh, Josh explained uh, the evidence for uh, the, the acceleration of the universe. So of course, uh, dark energy may be as simple as uh, a cosmological constant. So it's the simplest model to explain uh, uh, the acceleration of the universe. Um, and uh, it's very simple. So it, it's, uh, it's just uh, the, the idea that uh, the stress energy tensor in, in the universe contain a piece uh, which is uh, proportional to the metric and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the famous cosmological constant. And uh, I remind you that uh, a cosmological constant uh, has a stress energy tensor that gives uh, an acceleration in, uh, in, the Friedman, in the second Friedman equation because uh, the pressure is negative. So a positive uh, cosmological constant, uh, since the pressure is minus uh, uh, rho, this parenthesis is negative and you get uh, an accelerating universe. So what's wrong about the cosmological constant? Uh, well, uh, what is wrong is that uh, we have no idea of uh, how to predict uh, or to justify the size of the cosmological constant. Uh, naively, a cosmological constant 
would uh, um, arise for all, fluctu all quantum fluctuations, for all fields that, uh, um, that, um, that compose uh, the standard model and, and, uh, and all the physics beyond the standard model maybe. But naively, if you, um, if you buy these, uh, then you would say that uh, na very naively, you can calculate uh, um, the, uh, the contributions uh, to the cosmological constant coming, for instance, uh, from a loop, uh, say, of, of, of electrons or any, any particles uh, coupled, of course, to, to, to gravity. And uh, you're basically summing up uh, uh, the zero point energy at least in the free theory of uh, all possible oscillators. But uh, apart from the details, uh, you get something which is uh, clearly, uh, since the cosmological constant has dimension four, you get something which is quartically divergent. And uh, okay, we don't know really how, where this uh, integral should be, should be cut off, but uh, uh, since we have no evidence of uh, of uh, new physics, at least an, at, up to the TV scale, which is the scale probed by, um, by LAC. Uh, so we could uh, guess, for instance, that uh, the cosmological constant is uh, of order TV to the fourth, uh, but this is a huge number. So this uh, is, 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 is huge compared to uh, what is observed, because what is observed is, is uh, 60 orders of magnitude below this number. And, uh, and uh, we have a really no explanation. So the, the observed value of the cosmological constant is of order 10 to minus three electron volt to the fourth, which is a, a scale which is small uh, compared to basically any scale that appears in uh, particle physics. So I don't, I don't have anything smart to say about the cosmological constant problem. Um, not many interesting solutions were proposed. Um, Unfortunately, the only one uh, that, uh, um, that is important to remember is the one uh, basically proposed by Weinberg uh, in, uh, in the late uh, 80s, uh, which is basically saying that uh, um, a universe like ours uh, can only um, rise with a sufficiently small cosmological constant. If the cosmological constant were much bigger or, 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 or negative and uh, so independent of the sign, if the cosmological constant has a size which is very much bigger than what is observed, then the universe would be completely different uh, with, uh, um, with no formation of structure. And these uh, can be, uh, and these of course uh, would be not uh, um, the place where life uh, could easily form, okay? So this is, I don't want to enter too much into the philosophical discussion. This is called the, the, the entropic explanation for the cosmological constant. Uh, of course, Weinberg did it uh, as a prediction in the sense that it was done uh, when uh, there was no evidence of, uh, of the positive cosmological constant. So it was a really a remarkable uh, um, idea, but uh, uh, still uh, it remains uh, uh, it's an idea that cannot be really be tested easily. And so, um, so, so we're still fighting with the idea that um, whether uh, this is the explanation for the acceleration of the universe. So um, now what, do, what can we do? Okay, so, um, well, we are physicists. So at the very least we should try to test. Um, so we have a very simple model, which is the cosmological constant, but, uh, um, we can play with other models and in general, uh, anything which is not the cosmological constant, but explains the acceleration of the universe, uh, we can call it dark energy. So what is dark energy? Well, um, we don't really know, uh, but uh, in general, uh, it is something that uh, will violate uh, spontaneously Lorentz invariance. What does it mean? It just means that uh, uh, you can think about dark energy as an additional fluid um, on top of, uh, you know, there is dark matter, there is uh, uh, radiation, there are neutrinos. And then uh, we can think that there is an additional medium um, which uh, induces uh, the acceleration of the universe. For instance, uh, the, the simplest model that you can have in mind is, uh, uh, is, uh, is something uh, that is similar to inflation. So you have a very flat potential. So you have a scalar field phi 
and you have a potential which is very flat and you have a, a field which is rolling along this potential. Um, so when I say that uh, Lorentz invariance is broken, I just mean that, uh, of course, uh, um, the surfaces of constant uh, phi will uh, induce uh, a preferred uh, foliation in your space time, okay? um, which will break spontaneously Lorentz invariance. So in, in, in the sense that any fluid will uh, pick up a frame, the frame in which uh, the fluid is, is at rest. So why I'm stressing this point? Because uh, uh, because I want to, to make a connection with uh, dark energy. Sorry, I want to make a connection between dark energy and uh, gravitational waves. So uh, if uh, there is uh, a, a fluid, uh, I call it a fluid in a general sense. So if there is a, something which, uh, um, which um, um, pick up a frame, um, gravitational waves uh, will travel th through this uh, medium before getting to our detectors. And in general, uh, I can expect uh, that uh, some effect uh, will, uh, will, will occur. Um, so you have to think about this as, uh, as uh, having light uh, that goes uh, through a medium, okay? So in general, what can happen? Well, in, in general, uh, going back to what I was saying before, the speed of gravitational waves uh, as they propagate uh, through this medium uh, they may be different from the speed of propagation in, in vacuum, in the vacuum. Um, or you can have uh, other effects. For instance, uh, some of the gravitational waves may be absorbed by, uh, by, this, uh, by this blob, by this uh, fluid, um, or they can have dispersion, meaning that the different uh, frequencies of the, of the gravitational waves uh, will behave differently, and so on and so forth. So, um, so after um, we uh, detected uh, uh, for the first time gravitational waves propagating uh, from the other side of the universe in some sense to us, uh, people start thinking about uh, what this says about the dark energy because uh, uh, since we are so ignorant about this, uh, uh, this, uh, this system, this additional uh, um, fluid in the universe, uh, at least we can put some constraints that taking into account that the gravitational wave go through it and, uh, and they reach the, the detector. So we can put at least bounds on what dark energy may be. So it's very similar to try to probe a material shining light, shining light through the material and understanding uh, what is the speed of light, uh, how much light is absorbed, if there is dispersion and so on and so forth. So we are trying to test dark energy through gravitational waves. So let me now go a bit more into details. This is the, the general uh, idea. Um, of course, uh, again, uh, this is just uh, one point of view. Of course, uh, um, as uh, Freeman explained, uh, there is uh, a lot going on in large scale structure to um, to study dark energy, but here I just want to focus on another uh, approach, another uh, set of observations that can say something alternative, something different uh, about uh, dark energy. Okay, let me now go a bit more into, into details. So, uh, first of all, let me go back to the measurement of the speed of gravitational waves. Um, so, so as, as I said, that this single measurement, so the observation of the gravitational wave event together with the electromagnetic counterpart, which has this, uh, this name, so the, the comparison between these two events set this beautiful bound on the speed of gravitational waves. So uh, just to, to compare, uh, before this event, uh, we, didn't, we didn't know much about the speed of gravitational waves. Uh, there were bounds coming from the Cherenkov radiation because if the if a graviton um, so, so if uh, um, if uh, the speed of gravity of gravitons is different from uh, the speed of um, uh, light, then you can have uh, gravitational Cherenkov radiation. So uh, very high energy particles would emit uh, energy in gravitational waves. But this is a bound that only applies. Uh, to very, um, at very high energy. And also it applies only um, if the speed has uh, uh, one of the side of the inequality, not on, on the other. 
Um, but any, anyway, it was a, a weak bound that was completely um, superseded by this new measurement. Now, let me uh, say something about uh, these, uh, what, what kind of measurements we are doing. Um, so because uh, the, the logic is that I want to apply the bound I get uh, from this measurement uh, to the, the physics of uh, dark energy. So, uh, so in physics, it's always important to understand that, uh, uh, you know, what are the scales in the problem? Um, because uh, in general, uh, the effective theory that you use to describe physics uh, at a given scale may not be the same uh, as the one that you need for to describe physics at the different scales. Okay? So at, at low energy, you have the, the Fermi theory. When you go to higher energy, you have the standard model. So at each uh, scale, you must be careful about uh, um, what you're doing. Now, um, so this, if you want, is, is a caveat to what we are saying. Um, so the measurement that we are doing involves uh, uh, wavelengths of order 10,000 kilometers. Uh, about, uh, so of course, there is a, a, the frequency depends on, on time. So you are scanning through a certain range, but we're talking about, uh, uh, well, from the point of view of particle physics, these are extremely low energy measurements because we're talking about uh, uh, scales which are 10,000 kilometers. Uh, on the other end, uh, let me, mentioned that uh, um, cosmology, of course, has to do with uh, much, much, much bigger scales. So, um, so it is reasonable that the same effective theory that describes uh, these events is also applicable for, for even larger scales. But of course, uh, it's a caveat because we're talking about the quite different scales. So uh, it could be that uh, uh, you cannot use the same effective theory. Um, another important point uh, to stress is that um, uh, these events, uh, are, I mean, this particular event uh, is, is very far away, where it's uh, very far away compared, for instance, uh, to, to, to our galaxy. And the reason why this is important uh, is because, uh, well, uh, the local environment uh, uh, may be complicated. So you, you may have heard that uh, in some dark energy models, uh, there is the, the, the so-called screening. Screening uh, basically means that uh, uh, there is a difference uh, between what happens on cosmological scales uh, compared to what happens when you go to an overdense region, uh, for instance, uh, inside our galaxy. Um, so since the environment is very different, uh, so the, the, the Newtonian potential is much larger, this may affect, um, so just to flash some words, uh, so there is this um, um, models uh, of chameleon or Einstein screening. So these are, are all phenomena in which uh, uh, basically the, the physics uh, in, in a region, in an overdense region is, is quite different from uh, uh, what happens on cosmological scales. So since uh, this uh, um, event uh, took place, uh, I mean, 40 megaparsec is, is a very large distance. It's not, uh, it's, is, is smaller than the size of the universe, is much smaller, but it's still, uh, we're talking about a measurement that goes through um, a, a range uh, which is much larger than the size of our galaxy. So it's uh, in most models, uh, one can say that I can uh, neglect the screening over these very large uh, distances. Um, okay, now let me get uh, even uh, a bit more technical uh, and because I want to, 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 to explain uh, um, what happens when, when you use these constraints on, a, on concrete models of, of dark energy? Well, uh, as I said, uh, we don't have very concrete models of dark energy. So people are, are sort of uh, more parametrizing the dark energy because, uh, um, because we don't know what it is. And uh, let me focus uh, on a particular parametrization of dark energy that goes under the name of effectively theory of dark energy. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very similar idea was applied to, to inflation. And uh, without, I mean, uh, there will be some details and some complicated formulas, but I want just to uh, convey the idea. So the details uh, you can find in the papers. So the idea is just the following, that uh, since I don't know what dark energy is, I try to parametrize what it can be. So in order to parametrize something and writing uh, an effective theory for, uh, for the system, I had to, First of all, I have to tell you what are the symmetries of the system. And then I, I, I will start writing down all possible operators 
that are compatible with the symmetries. So this is what happens, uh, for instance, in the standard model, but it happens in condensed matter in, in every possible uh, application of, of effective field theory. So, first, so let's uh, so this entails some assumption, and uh, uh, let's do as a, an assumption. So let's uh, assume that the dark energy, uh, um, as uh, as uh, as I was uh, as in the example I was mentioning before. So if you take uh, an evolving scalar field, um, then uh, um, what happens is that uh, you, you have a preferred uh, foliation. So this is uh, um, the surface of constant uh, uh, value of this scalar field. So this goes back to what I was saying before. So dark energy spontaneously breaks Lorentz invariance because there is something which evolves in time. And so, uh, defines uh, slices of constant time. So if you have a system like this, uh, this means that uh, um, in some sense, uh, diff, diff invariance is broken because th there are privileged slices of time. Okay? And uh, so the formalism is similar to what, when you, when you use the ADM formalism in, uh, in general relativity, if you, if you remember um, what it is. Um, but it's not very important. So the, the, the logic is that uh, I have a preferred slices of time. And so when I write the action for my system, I'm allowed to write many more operators. So in general, so if I, if I only have general relativity, I will write uh, the only object that I can write down at the leading order in derivatives, uh, apart from the cosmological constant, of course, uh, which is the Ricci uh, scalar, so the four dimensional Ricci scalar. But this is because I, I'm assuming that uh, there is no preferred foliation of uh, space time. If there is a foliation, well, then I, I can start writing down many more geometrical objects, okay? Um, the details are not important, but I can start writing down uh, uh, something that has to do with the laps, uh, which is the, the G00 component of the metric. I can start writing down objects that has to do with the, the extrinsic curvature of uh, these, uh, um, of this uh, of the surface, which is this tensor here, something that has to do with the uh, intrinsic uh, uh, Ricci tensor of this geometry, and, and so on and so forth. The details are really are, are not important. Um, of course, uh, I want to stress that uh, it's a parameterization. So I'm, I'm making some assumption about what dark energy is. Um, I'm also making uh, another assumption, which is the fact that I'm assuming. Uh, that there is a universal coupling in the sense that dark matter and the standard model, for instance, they couple to the same metric. These are all assumptions that go into this. Of course, one can go beyond this assumption generalizing what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. Okay, so, the, mm, so if you go through this uh, uh, exercise, uh, you get some, you get many operators. So, so don't look at too much at the, to, to, at the details of this, uh, of this formula. Uh, so you have many um, operators uh, parameterized by various uh, coefficients, okay? And uh, you, can, uh, you can say, okay, now I will uh, um, do my experiments and I will try to uh, put bounds on uh, what these uh, parameters are. Um, let me do some examples just to, just to say that we're talking about something uh, not uh, so mysterious. For instance, uh, the first three terms uh, describe uh, what is a quintessence model? So, so a quintessence model, as I said again, it's a model in which you have a simple uh, scalar field uh, which is evolving uh, along its potential. Okay. So why it has this form? Well, because uh, the action for for this case it contains a kinetic term. And uh, and there is also a potential term. But since uh, um, so when I when I write these. Uh, uh, this action, uh, as I said, I'm assuming that time coincides uh, with uh, the surfaces uh, of constant phi. So basically I'm doing a choice of gauge in which I assume that uh, phi is uh, uh, up to a constant, is proportional to time. Okay? So there are no fluctuations in this. So this means that uh, uh, when, when I, so these, uh, these uh, derivatives are just constant and this object becomes just G upper zero, zero. So this is the reason why you have G0 here. here. Then you have, uh, well, maybe it's the wrong name. This lambda is not a cosmological constant, but uh, it, can be, it can depend on time. 
So if you want, it's the potential um, written uh, as a function of time. Uh, then there is the, the usual einstein hilbert term with the with the potentially a function in front, like in the in the usual brans uh, coupling. And then uh, there are, of course, many other operators. So just to illustrate, so this operator is an operator that changes the speed of uh, uh, the dark energy perturbations. Um, this operator is an operator that appears when you study, um, you may have heard this DGP model. Uh, sometimes it's also called braiding models. Um, and then in general, uh, you, you may have heard uh, uh, models uh, which are called Galileons, uh, Hordensky theories, beyond Hordensky theories, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if the details are not important, but uh, I just want to say that uh, this uh, uh, parametrization allows me to uh, describe uh, um, all the models uh, within this uh, class of symmetries that people discuss in, in the literature. Um, so maybe let me um, just to introduce some jargon. Uh, so for people that are not uh, um, not in this field. So when you when you hear about Hordensky theory, uh, it means the following. It means that people wrote down um, wrote down a, a, a very general Lagrangian for the scalar field, with the only assumption that uh, it gives rise to second order equation of motion. Of course, second order equation of motion uh, it's it's a healthy system because you know the, the the Cauchy problem is well defined because everything is second order. Um, so people went beyond Ordensky because there are models in which uh, even if uh, you have uh, some uh, higher derivative terms, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the system is still, uh, uh, the Cauchy problem is still well defined in, in the sense that there are no Ostrogansky instabilities. Uh, so this is even more general, but people even went beyond Ordensky, beyond, beyond Ordensky, models which are called those and so on and so forth. Okay. So there is a, a whole plethora of, of um, additional models that one can consider. Okay, so it doesn't matter. So, the, the, so what, the, what, the, what I want to convey is that there is a way to parameterize uh, perturbations. So I, I want to, to stress this. Um, so, um, so at the end, what you can observe are small perturbations. So you can observe, of course, uh, the background that uh, dark energy gives. So dark energy, by definition, contributes uh, in giving the acceleration of the universe. And then one can study small fluctuations around this uh, uh, FRW solution. Okay, And uh, this uh, um, effective field of dark energy is just a way to parameterize uh, the physics of these perturbations. For instance, uh, you can check that uh, these terms uh, they contribute uh, to linear perturbations. So they, they contribute to the, um, to the kinetic term of linear perturbations. While uh, these additional terms, uh, they start cubic. Uh, so they only matter if you're interested in going beyond uh, linear perturbation theory. For instance, because you want to see what happens with screening, uh, you want to go to short scales and so on and so on and so forth. But if you're interested just in linear perturbations, you just stop uh, at this level over here. Okay, so now let's let's come to gravitational waves. Um, uh, let's let's skip this. Um, so, so the, the one point that I want to make is that some of these operators uh, change the speed of gravitational waves. And since uh, we now have uh, very nice measurements of the speed, uh, we have uh, very tight constraints of these operators. Okay. Um, so let me explain this because it's uh, it's uh, maybe it's an important point. So there are two ways of seeing this. So one way is uh, so if you look at this operator, this operator contains uh, the extrinsic curvature of these uh, surfaces, so of the surfaces of constant uh, um, dark energy, if you want. And if you remember, uh, the extrinsic curvature it is basically the time derivative of the metric. So by time I mean the the, the Time is orthogonal to the surface, so the extrinsic curvature has to do with the time derivative of the metric. But this means that uh, this term contains a piece uh, which is gamma ij dot squared. And this, of course, contributes to the kinetic term of gravitational waves. 
And therefore, since uh, it is only the time kinetic term and not the spatial kinetic term, I am changing the speed of propagation of gravitational waves. Um, well, if you wanted to, to, to see it uh, maybe in, in another way, let me, let me um, also say this. Well, maybe I will explain it in, in a second in, in the following slide. Um, um, so the measurements that uh, we discussed, uh, they put uh, very nice bounds on this, uh, uh, on this um, coefficient. But it turns out that there are also other bounds because uh, the gravitational wave that we observe do not propagate in, on exact uh, FRW. They propagate, uh, of course, there are, um, there are small perturbations um, because we are not uh, living in an exactly homogeneous universe. So this means that uh, um, they are, in some sense, they are also probing uh, uh, other operators here. I don't want to enter too much into details, but what I'm saying is that uh, I have not only, my constraint is, is, is not only that uh, gravitational waves must uh, propagate at the speed of light uh, on the FRW background, but they must propagate at the speed of light, even taking into account uh, the perturbations in the universe, since the measurement is so precise, 10 to minus 15, that I'm also sensitive to this uh, uh, propagation, uh, taking into account the variation, for instance, of the Newtonian potential. Um, so anyway, so to cut uh, the story short, uh, this uh, puts uh, very nice bounds on these, uh, on these operators, uh, uh, as it was realized uh, by many people uh, long ago, so a few years ago, not, not so much ago. Um, so when I say that uh, the bounds are good, uh, so I, I just erase uh, these operators, what do I mean? Why, when there is nothing, I mean, uh, we'll have some constraints, it's not zero. But uh, the reason why I, I, I just uh, erase these operators is because uh, you should compare the bounds that we get uh, using gravitational waves with the bounds that uh, you get uh, using other methods. For instance, uh, when you talk about uh, large scale structure, uh, the operators that I just wrote are operators that change a bit uh, the gravity, of course. So they will affect, uh, for instance, the clustering of, um, of, um, of, of, of a large scale structure. Um, and of course, you can hope to put bounds, uh, probably uh, Josh explained this, uh, you can hope to put bounds on deviations from general relativity. So you can put bounds on these operators using large-scale structure measurements. So in order to quantify the effect on large-scale structure, people use these dimensionless parameters, which are basically these parameters just divided by the appropriate powers of M Planck and H. Um, and uh, basically, these are the typical deviations from, uh, from general relativity. And uh, of course, OK, we can hope to put some bound, but uh, well, we can put the bounds of order 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 2. Okay, so we can check that uh, um, general relativity works on large, on, uh, uh, large scales using uh, large scale structure observations, but uh, with uh, some precision, not too much. Here we're talking about uh, bounds which are way, way better. So the bound on this operator, oh, sorry, on this, uh, uh, maybe I should talk about the ratio, these dimensional ratios, uh, is of order, depending a bit on the details, but are of order 10 to minus 10. Uh, uh, so they are way, way better than what one can obtain using Lasky structure observations. That's why um, I, I just erased some of these operators. So the message, uh, forgetting about the details, is that in some case, with, for some of these operators, uh, the observation of gravitational waves can do a job which is much better than what uh, Lasky structure can do. Um, and it, let's see what's time. Uh, so yes, I think uh, I think I have fifteen more minutes, right? Uh, that's correct, right. right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, let me um, um, for people that are more familiar with this, let me um, let me say that all what I said can be also understood without using this effective theory description, uh, writing down a very general Lagrangian for a scalar field. It's a very complicated Lagrangian, so that, that uh, we don't care about the details. So it's just a function of this uh, scalar phi. And uh, I write a really, really general Lagrangian. 
Um, this goes uh, under the name of, as I said, of Ordensky theories or beyond Ordensky theories. So the logic is that I write all what I can write with the only assumption that uh, uh, the equations of motion are of second order, uh, or that if they are not of second order, there is uh, some theorem that says that uh, the Cauchy problem is well defined. So these are uh, good theories for this uh, scalar uh, field. Um, so now I just want to, so of course everything can be rephrased uh, and you get the same result. Uh, um, maybe I can explain where the speed of gravitational waves come from in, in this language. It comes from, uh, from the following. So you see that this Lagrangian contains many second derivatives of the scalar. In particular, it contains operators which are the mu, the new phi squared. Uh, but now, so I remind you that we are expanding around a background in which the speed of this uh, uh, dark energy field is different from zero. So it's evolving in time. So you remember that, uh, of course, the Christopher symbols uh, appears in these covariant derivatives. And in particular, there are terms which are like these, schematically. Um, and so you see that uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, so the Christopher symbols are derivatives of the metric. So we get terms out of this action, which are derivatives of the metric squared. And in particular, you can check that you get, as I said before, a term which is of this form that changes the speed of gravitational waves, okay? So it is another way to understand the, the, the same thing. Okay, so the bottom line is that uh, we took this very general theory, we describe it uh, in various ways, but uh, we get uh, good constraints looking at gravitational waves. Um, so I want to skip this, uh, but uh, um, maybe I should uh, emphasize uh, a question and then uh, without giving the answer. But uh, of course you can ask, okay, now you told me that some of these coefficients uh, are very, very small. Well, usually, uh, well, in, uh, in quantum field theory, if some, something is set to zero, then uh, you start saying, okay, but is it uh, relatively stable? So this is the same uh, problem that we face, uh, for instance, with the Higgs mass. So, uh, so the Higgs mass is much smaller than the Planck scale, and we worry why it is the case. Okay, So you can worry about the same similar thing here. So you can say, okay, you put constraint on, uh, on this uh, coefficient, uh, uh, does it does it make sense to keep this coefficient very small and at the same time leave these uh, large and observable in, in in the future well it turns out that it's uh, it's uh, it, well the, the short answer is that uh, yes so it, it is uh, possible so it is possible to find the symmetries of the action which protects uh, um, protects uh, this remaining operator from uh, from um, so in a sense, you, you can keep these operators uh, large or observable without inducing uh, um, operators that I, I do not observe because of uh, the, the, uh, the fact that the, the speed of gravitational waves is uh, uh, very close to the speed of uh, electromagnetic waves. So the reason uh, is, is quite complicated, but uh, this symmetry, this uh, Lagrangian that I was describing as many uh, approximate symmetries uh, just to flash some name, there is an approximate uh, Galilean invariance. So Galilean invariance, it's, uh, um, so it's, uh, it's this symmetry. Instead of having a shift symmetry on, on a scalar, which is typical of a Goldstone boson, you have uh, a more sophisticated uh, symmetry in which uh, the scalar is not shifted by a constant, but it is shifted by something which is linear in the coordinates. Okay. Um, Okay, then the, these, uh, uh, these Galileons, so these uh, operators which are invariant under the symmetry, they have uh, uh, various uh, properties of no renormalization, which these properties are broken when, when you look, uh, when you couple the system to gravity. So you have to check that, uh, that the, the effects are small. So it's, a, it's a, an interesting but, uh, but a long story. So to cut the, the story short, uh, as I said, it is possible to write uh, a, an action for dark energy, which is, uh, um, which is relatively stable, and it satisfies the constraints that, uh, that I mentioned. So the, the, I mean, it, so the fact that some operators is small, but some is large, is not really a tuning in the sense that at least uh, 
uh, if I look at loop corrections, uh, this uh, um, situation is not uh, spoiled by loop correction. Okay? So it's still uh, possible to, to set to zero some of these coefficients and uh, having uh, some effects due to the others. Um, so in the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, I just want to flash uh, some additional effects uh, besides uh, the change in the speed of propagation that uh, uh, people studied which are all related to the fact that uh, the graviton is moving uh, um, inside this uh, gravitational wave, uh, sorry, this um, dark energy uh, fluid uh, in some sense. So um, one effect is uh, the possibility that the gravitons are absorbed by, as they propagate through, um, through dark energy. Um, so the, well, this is not uh, surprising. Uh, so light uh, can be uh, absorbed as it travels through um, a material. So here, what happens? Uh, well, gamma is the graviton. And uh, of course, uh, I have uh, fluctuations of my dark energy field, which is a scalar, which is, I call it pi. So in general, uh, when I write my, uh, my action with all these operators, in general, I expect to have a coupling between a graviton and two uh, pi's, um, or a coupling like gamma gamma pi. So in general, uh, these diagrams uh, give the possibility to the graviton to decay into uh, dark energy particles. Notice, uh, let me open a small parenthesis. Notice that uh, in uh, this is only possible because uh, we are in a medium because Lorentz invariance is spontaneously broken. In general, a massless particle like, like the graviton will not decay into, uh, will not decay in practice. And so if you think about the kinematics, it can only decay collinearly in, uh, because it cannot, it cannot decay between two, two particles uh, with, with an angle. So it can only decay collinearly, but this, this, this sort of collinear decay, you should think about more like a, a, a renormalization of the state. So, um, so um, this is just to say that usually we do not talk about uh, the decay of a massless particle in a relativistic theory, but here we are in a medium. So here you should think about uh, uh, the decay as uh, having uh, a wave, uh, which uh, in, indeed a phonon in, uh, in a fluid, which uh, is a massless particle, but can decay into uh, other particles. Again, uh, I don't... Uh, uh, enter into details, so what is important is, is, uh, is the idea. So the idea is that uh, you take one of these operators that I was uh, mentioning, in particular, you take one which is not constrained by the, by the other uh, observation, um, and uh, you try to look at these vertices. In particular, this vertex looks, uh, is more important, is more constraining, and uh, you find uh, a coupling and uh, you can calculate the decay width of uh, the graviton in this system, and you get some, uh, some, uh, some expression. So this uh, CS, uh, uh, CS is the speed of uh, pi. So before we were talking about the speed of gravitational waves, and we said that this is very similar to the speed of, uh, um, of uh, electromagnetic waves. But we don't know anything about the speed of this pi. So pi is just this uh, excitation of the dark energy fluid. So this we don't know what it is. Okay, and uh, so I keep it here as a parameter. So what is important is that uh, is that also from this kind of uh, um, of course uh, we don't observe this. So it, it looks that uh, gravitational waves uh, traveling from uh, the neutron star or traveling from a black hole uh, binary do not lose, uh, uh, they do not disappear significantly. So we can put bounds on, uh, um, on the parameters of, uh, that I was describing. In particular, you can put bounds on this uh, ratio, uh, dimensional ratio, which is called alpha h, which is uh, again quite small. And uh, again, much smaller than what I can observe in Alaska structure observation. Um, well, let me really flash this. Uh, you, you may remember that uh, when you have a decay by the optical theorem, you have also have uh, dispersion. So what do I mean by dispersion? I mean that uh, dispersion means that uh, um, different uh, 
wavelengths, different frequencies for the gravitational wave will behave differently. Um, so in particular, you can have a, uh, a, a yeah, the, 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 the dispersion relation for each mode will be different. And uh, this is due to, to a graph uh, like this, which is just, uh, you know, this, the, the, if, you, if you have a decay, you're going also to have a graph like this. And uh, you can check that uh, uh, this gives uh, uh, a dispersion relation, which is not uh, the, 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 the relativistic one with a speed equal to the speed of uh, uh, electromagnetic waves, but there are also corrections uh, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, uh, they will say that uh, different uh, wavelengths uh, travel at a different speed, but we have a lot of constraints on this. Uh, and again, this uh, is, uh, is, um, is a constraint on uh, this general model of dark energy. Um, well, let me skip the caveat. Uh, also, let me skip this. Uh, let me flash uh, a couple of more um, uh, examples and conclude. Um, so actually, what we realized, what people realized that um, the decay of the, of the gravitational wave uh, may not be the best description. So usually you, 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 you can look at the Feynman diagram uh, like, like the one I was describing uh, only when you're talking about a single graviton. But here we don't have a single graviton. We have a huge number of gravitons because we have uh, a coherent large, well, large, in, I mean, it's very small, but it, it still is not a quantum mechanical gravitational waves. It contains a lot of uh, uh, quanta. And uh, in, in this case, uh, in order to describe uh, the interaction between the gravitational wave and uh, the scalars, uh, it's more appropriate to think about uh, the gravitational waves as a background, which oscillates in time. It induces uh, uh, the effects on uh, um, the dark energy perturbations. So uh, I, I, I want to cut it very short, but uh, uh, these, uh, you can, uh, so, so you have a coupling gamma pi pi. So you have an equation for pi of this sort, okay? So you have gamma, which is uh, this uh, classical gravitational wave, which uh, uh, appears in the pi equation in this form. And uh, you may remember that once you have uh, an oscillating part uh, in the differential equation, you can have resonances. Okay. In particular, you can cast this equation in the so-called, uh, um, so in the, in, in the, in the form uh, in, um, that describe uh, um, resonances. So it takes a bit of algebra, so it's not uh, uh, completely straightforward, but at the end you can cast the, 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 the equation in the, um, in the form of, uh, that satisfy the Floquet theorem. Um, so this is basically the equation that describes the instability of uh, a kid on, uh, on a swing. Um, and the, this equation is, is very well known and uh, uh, it's known that there are bands of instabilities and uh, one can study what happens in, uh, in, in this case. So it's a, it's a long story, but uh, uh, you can do uh, quite a lot of progress uh, analytically. And uh, the only thing that I want to say is that uh, uh, that, uh, okay, we get additional constraints. Um, I don't have time to explain all the details, but we look at uh, the constraints that LIGO and Virgo put, uh, and also what uh, in the future we can say using LISA, which of course it's an experiment uh, looking at completely different frequencies. And uh, there are various uh, uh, limits of our calculations, but uh, the, the region here, is ruled out by present and future observations. And you see that uh, we're talking about uh, alpha H uh, much smaller. Before we were talking about uh, alpha H less than 10 to minus 10. Here we're talking about much smaller uh, values. Um, finally, to conclude the last, the last thing is that uh, sometimes uh, um, the gravitational wave may also induce instabilities uh, in the dark energy sector. So the, the equation is basically the same, but if uh, this parameter is big enough, you see that, uh, um, so when this becomes very large, uh, it will change sign. It, it will induce uh, some sort of gradient instability for um, the perturbation in the dark energy. Um, so this happens for some of these operators. 
um, so everything is parameterized by this parameter beta, which basically compare this term with uh, the kinetic term. And it turns out that uh, for sufficiently large gravitational waves, uh, we enter in this regime of instability. Instability means that uh, this pi uh, will, will be copiously produced. Okay? And uh, um, this is the, the last uh, uh, slide. Um, it turns out that uh, this is a plot. Uh, so we have the chirp mass here, so different uh, objects. So as they, sp they spiral uh, and they get to the coalescence, uh, the frequency increases. So you go from here to higher frequencies until uh, they basically merge. Okay. So these uh, uh, lines say that uh, uh, if I look at one of these events at a certain distance, for instance, one megaparsec or 10 megaparsec, when uh, you reach uh, the instability that I was talking about, uh, depending on the parameters of the model. And, uh, and uh, you, can you can see that uh, um, some interesting region of parameter space is, is ruled out. Uh, of course, uh, you, you should compare with other things, but, uh, but uh, I just want to, to tell that also in this case, there are some uh, interesting uh, regime which is uh, ruled out by these uh, observations. So I, I think I was, I was quick, but I, I just wanted to, to, uh, to, uh, to sell the idea and all the details, which are a bit complicated. So what, uh, what I wanted to, to tell you is that uh, uh, in the last few years, the, the, the gravitational wave uh, uh, probe um, opened and uh, um, it gave uh, interesting uh, constraints on uh, the dark energy sector. Uh, we talked about the speed of gravitational waves. We talked about the possibility of uh, dispersion and absorption of gravitons, uh, resonant decay of gravitational waves, instabilities. So the conclusion is that uh, it may be that at the end, uh, the acceleration is just due to a cosmological constant, which uh, in my view is, is most likely the, the simplest and, uh, and uh, probably true explanation. On the other hand, I think it's, uh, it's nice to be able to constrain uh, our uh, freedom um, and uh, ruling out uh, um, many possibilities. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, sh should be seen as uh, a, a complementary approach, uh, of course, uh, to the main one. So the main one, of course, is uh, to look at, uh, to use uh, last scale structure measurement as uh, uh, Freeman was describing uh, to constrain uh, uh, dark energy, uh, but it, it's interesting that uh, we also get some information coming from a completely different direction using gravitational waves. And I think I will stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much for this nice lecture. And also thank you for the information on ICTP. Uh, we are open for questions now. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself uh, and directly ask the questions, or you can type in the chat box. I'm also open to answer questions via email later on if people are more are interested, both about uh, dark energy and also about ICTP in case uh, somebody is, is interested. Okay. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, so I have two questions uh, yeah. because I'm not familiar with the dark yeah. energy. So, <laughs> um, so you write an action here and you have a, a, a bunch of terms that's coming from the effective field theory. So, um, uh, from what I remember, uh, what from what I know from uh, particle physics, when we have a effective operator, we have a scale, uh, energy scale with it. But the mass term will be like in the denominator, not in the numerator. So what's yeah. the m two m three m four? Good, good. It's a it's a good question. Um, yeah, it's it's a good question. So what happens uh, is just a, a question of normalization. Uh, maybe. Let me, let me start with something uh, uh, that uh, you, you may be familiar with. So even in the case of gravity, so the action that we write down uh, is this, right? Um, so, in, in, but uh, you're right. So, it, so here you see there is a, there is a mass scale numerator, but you may, you are core, you're, what you are saying is that in, in uh, usually when I study quantum field theory, usually I have, uh, as I go to higher and higher order, I have mass terms that denominate. This comes just from, from a normalization because uh, um, in the case of gravity, so this object, uh, 
I can expand it and it contains quadratic term for gravitational waves. And then there are all possible interactions of this form. Schematically, of course, there are a lot of indices contracted. And you see, the problem is that H here is dimensionless, while in quantum field theory, you're used to a field with dimension one. But you can change the normalization. You can write this as dH canonical squared. And then you start having, as you want, and Planck at denominator once you go into canonical normalization, and so on and so forth. So one Planck squared, and so on and so forth. So these, these so you, 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 you see what I'm saying, yeah? Yeah. So, um, so the same thing happens here. It's a good question in a sense. Is uh, so we have these because we are basically, in some sense, we are extending the gravitational way, the gravitational action with additional terms that describe dark energy. So we are in, in a normalization. So here the metric um, as dimension zero is just the, the dimensionless perturbation in the metric. But uh, if you play the same uh, uh, game here, uh, so you go in uh, in a canonical normalization, you're going to get uh, interactions which are suppressed by a certain mass scale. For instance, uh, let me show an example uh, here. So when I was talking about the decay of uh, gravitational waves uh, here. Um, so at, at the beginning, I had this uh, uh, expression. But if you go to canonical normalization, you see that. Uh, so, so what I want to say is that uh, in this expression, you see that there is a, a mass scale uh, at denominator. OK, so this, uh, um, when you go to canonical normalization, this is, uh, is an operator. Um, if I put canonical normalization, uh, this is an operator with dimension uh, to put lambda cube at denominator because uh, uh, compared to the kinetic term, then I have an, an extra piece, which is gamma canonical double dot. So there are three more um, uh, three more masses and numerator. So this is a, a higher dimension operator. So you're completely right. And it's good to, that you think about this. So you, you, what you're writing down is uh, at the end of, uh, of the day for pi, is a bunch of higher dimensional operators suppressed by a certain scale. And on top of this, of course, you have the coupling with gravity. Okay. Um, let me also take your, your, uh, your question to also to mention the following. The scale that suppresses uh, these uh, uh, interactions is very small. Um, I mentioned this uh, in passing when I was uh, talking about uh, uh, relative stability. So the scales that usually appear in this action are extremely small from the point of view of uh, uh, particle physics, but this uh, should not come as a surprise. Of course, uh, you want to you, you want this dark energy sector to induce acceleration, and we uh, we know that the scale associated with the acceleration is very small. But, um, and so, basically, you have a theory with uh, interactions which are surprised by very small scale. But, uh, okay. Okay. And uh, my second question is, can you uh, explain again uh, about uh, uh, the idea of a massless particle with, but, but inside a, a med, uh, medium can decay into some massive particle? I still can feel Yes, about yeah, yeah. So what I was saying uh, in uh, quickly is the following, that uh, um, if, you are, if you are in a, in a relativistic uh, theory, mm -hmm. um, so think about, for, for instance, a photon, so the, and imagine that this photon, you, you, you want to, to, to consider a Feynman diagram in which the, the photon decays. Um, then, uh, I mean, the photon can, all, can only decay to massless particles um, in the forward direction. So if you, if you impose the, the, the kinematics, the relativistic kinematics, what you find is that this can only decay into two particles or more traveling uh, in, the, in, the, in the forward direction. Um, and, uh, okay, this possible. Um, on the other end, uh, it, I mean, it's very subtle and uh, um, I refer to, to some references in, in our papers. So um, on the other end, this collinear decay um, 
it's more like a, an infrared divergence. And uh, um, let me maybe say it in, in a more physical uh, way. Um, so for, um, um, so, so since there is no, um, um, yeah, so it is, uh, yeah. we understand that, that uh, a decay of a massless particle is not very well defined in, in relativistic theory. So, um, because uh, uh, if you have a, a, a massless particle, uh, there is no, um, um, there is no uh, Lorentz invariant, uh, uh, since I can, I can boost this particle, so this, this uh, a massless particle can have any energy, so I can boost it to any uh, frame and change uh, its energy um, in this way. So it, basically I cannot write any equation that tells me that gamma, um, I, I cannot uh, write any expression that tells me the decay rate uh, as a function of the energy. Um, while for a massive particle, I can, uh, I can go to the rest frame and uh, calculate the uh, decay rate there. Um, so, uh, sorry, maybe I was not very, very clear, but uh, um, this is, uh, is one way to see that uh, uh, a massless particle in, uh, in a relativistic theory can only mix with other massless particle like a gluon, but it cannot really decay. Completely different is the situation once you break Lorentz invariance because you are in a medium. For instance, a, a phonon, which is an excitation of, of a fluid, decays into two other phonons without problems at an angle. Okay. So, so, so this is completely different. Since we are talking about dark energy, so we have a, a fluid, this kind of process is possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay. If not, maybe I can ask one simple question. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, like, uh, are there any other uh, solution to cosmological constant problem that involves modified gravity and that kind of diverges from from the general relativity? If there are, uh, what is the problem in those kind of solutions? Um. It's a good question. Uh, so, um, so by solution to the cosmological constant problem, you really mean uh, something that explains uh, uh, the fact that the cosmological constant is uh, small. Right. Um, no, as, okay. I would say that as far as I know, there is no solution. Uh, mm. um, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think it is, uh, at least uh, for, for what I know, I, I, may, I may miss something. Um, so um, I think it is an important point because uh, um, you have to remember that uh, basically when we talk about dark energy, that's, what, that's why I call uh, these things parametrization because uh, it's not that, uh, let's compare the situation with dark energy with the situation with the beyond the standard model physics. So beyond the standard model physics, we have the, the hierarchy problem. There are, there are solutions like supersymmetry, uh, technical, okay, now, now they, they are in tension with experiments, but okay, there are solutions and you are looking for these signatures. Here, it's not that we have any solution to the cosmological constant problem. So we're just uh, parametrizing something which may be different. But uh, it, what I want to stress is that the models that I, I was showing it's not that they solve the cosmological constant problem. So it's, they are just the parametrization of deviations from the, the, the simplest scenario. So from this point of view, uh, so I think that the, 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 the feelings that exploring uh, gra modifications of gravity, one is, one is exploring uh, some, um, our ignorance about gravity maybe, and uh, uh, even without uh, having an explicit solution, hope to find something which, uh, uh, which, um, which shows that there is some deviation from generative. So these are, I think, the rules of, of the game. So the only, uh, at least conceptually, uh, the only direction in which people find some possible uh, solution, but very, very in quotation, uh, is, uh, is looking for mechanism for uh, relaxation of the cosmological constant. 
these are models in which uh, basically um, you, uh, you find a mechanism for which uh, the, 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 the cosmological evolution brings you at very early times, uh, drives you to a small cosmological constant dynamically. Um, so these at least conceptually are the only solution that I know are, are very contrived and not compelling at all. But uh, uh, in terms of dark energy, I'm not sure if there is anything very, very, very nice. I may, I may miss something and uh, you know, some, somebody may, may say that there is some solution. Of, um, I don't know, but uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you, no problem. Yeah. Uh, any questions, other questions? If not, uh, thank you again for thank this you. nice lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you at STP at a certain point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Okay, for everyone, we let's meet tomorrow again at nine. Uh, and tomorrow is the last day. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.